Welcome to the Consult ROI Podcast. Uh, my name is Cameron. I have Robert Ian Botnick here on the stage with me today. Uh, he's joining me from Bali. Uh, kind of jealous, not going to lie there. <laughs> but um, this man is, is probably one of the, I, I've just met him and that, but he's already, I, I've already got to know him as probably one of the brightest spirits and warm kindred souls uh, that I've had a pleasure of knowing. And, and I, I think it speaks to it just because I mean, the guy's history uh, really does speak to me on a number of levels. And I hope to, that it brings you guys a lot of value. He uh, grew up in a child's home where he, uh, most of the people and the kids there ended up either dead or in jail. Uh, it was very tragic, obviously, back, uh, backstory and, uh, and, and amazing testament to the man that's made him today. He uh, also wrote Soul Survivor, which kind of talks about that experience. I would definitely recommend checking that out. He now spreads his message of love and helping others uh, in despair through mentoring, coaching, speaking, hosting events, and running multiple businesses and charitable organizations. So thank you, Robert, for taking time out of your day to, to provide value here and, and uh, just spread more of your, that, that energy that you have. So I love it, but I'll, I'll let uh, you take the floor. Tell the people what you, um, <laughs> tell the people about yourself. <laughs> tell the people, tell the people. Hello, beautiful people. So as Cam said, uh, coming to you live here from Bali in Indonesia. I didn't even know where Bali, Indonesia was. I, I got to be honest, uh, I'm obviously born in the UK, uh, in London, as you might tell from this accent that I'm speaking to you with now. And uh, yeah, it was a, uh, kind of a dramatic life right so I started off as Cam said you know the 18 years growing up in two children's homes in London my parents from Jamaica had this fatal attraction uh, in the UK and it wasn't going to work out and consequently at the age of six months with my elder sister who's like a year and a half older we found ourselves growing up in two children's homes and you know so many things happened and you know it's interesting because I've recently turned 51 and uh, you know, last year, I took a look back over the last 50 years, and I have this overwhelming sense that life is happening for you, not to you. So when I look back, you know, what I see is that the children's home, you know, provided me with, uh, with, this, with this experience of human beings, right? So all different colors of the rainbow, uh, different ideologies, ways of seeing the world, accents, hair colors, uh, different ways of, of seeing you. And what I learned in the children's home was how to embrace empathy, how to embrace diversity and inclusion, that people that look different from you may sound different to you, um, may experience different to you in many ways are the same as you. So I got this complete sense of oneness uh, growing up in the children's home. I got this sense also of opportunities, taking opportunities of realizing that life doesn't necessarily mean that you get 100 years, 60 years. Life can end in a flash. So you have to make the most of every day that you have on the planet. And as Cameron said, I grew up around people that, you know, made some very tragic choices. One of which, Lee Burke, ended up him getting shot in the head um, over an argument playing pool. I mean, like some incredible experiences. And then moving on from the children's time, I learned about sport. I learned about how to achieve in sport. We have this glass ceiling that we put on ourselves. And if we remove that glass ceiling, then all sorts of things are possible that we can never imagine. So, you know, for example, I played basketball for my country. I ended up working with Madonna on one project. I had a business voted number three in the world. I ended up doing, you know, 2,000 events in five countries, which attracted 1.5 million people. These are offline events. I ended up becoming an inspirational speaker, a coach, an author. And now, as Cameron said, you know, I'm bringing together all of those experiences. So those 50 years of saying, well, this is what we've done. This is what we've achieved in 50 years. Now, for the next 50 years, if I get that, what is my intention? Who do I want to be around? Who do I want to inspire? Who do I want to be inspired by? And this, this led to um, this, um, these downloads of realizing you know, and this will seal it for you. So uh, recently I, I found my, my father again. 
and in our family tree um, of people like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, they're all Jamaican Maroons. Now, so bringing this all together, you know, what I realize is that I have a very powerful message of inspiration, integration, and realizing it's not where you start in life, but where you're going that's important and who you become along the way. So now I've literally brought all of these learnings and practices and ideologies and understandings and different crazy experiences together in, uh, in this mission of impacting. But this is the intention for my next 50 years, you know, how can I positively impact the lives of 1 billion people directly or indirectly, right? So that's my mission for the next 50 years, my intention for the next 50 years. We'll see if God gives me 50 years, but that's my intention for it, all right? So, so yeah, Ken, that's a little bit about me, a little bit about what I've learned, how I've integrated it into what I'm doing now. Dude, I, I absolutely love it. Um, and, and honestly, that's, that's a crazy goal. I mean, most people in that would be happy to influence a million people, let alone a billion. And uh, so that's very ambitious goal in that, but I, I know that you're well on your way. Um, as you've said, you've hosted a number of larger events um, and huge groups where you've already been able to affect millions. And I think with that energy and just telling your story or using that story as inspiration to be like, hey, look, I didn't have the best start. I didn't have the greatest luck and the greatest hand dealt with me, but um, I was able to uh, get out of that, change my status, and I didn't let it affect me and become my baggage that I carried with me and dragged through me into my later years of, of life. And so that, that's definitely inspirational. So I commend you on that. Um, what would you say was um, kind of the biggest struggle getting yourself out of that pit for the people that are maybe still in that pit? What would you say to them? Um, on how you were able to change that mindset and, and uh, get that inspiration and that drive to say, you know what, I'm not gonna end up like the rest of my friends. I'm going to, I'm going to make something in myself. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And this is ongoing guys, you know, like this is not, you know, like I've reached the top of the mountain, there's nothing left to do. It's not like that, you know. I believe firstly in mastery. So there's perfection and there's mastery. So perfection is the sense of, yeah, I've reached top of the mountain. I've done everything I wanted to do. I'm there. I'm done, right? We're good. Mastery is a sense of whatever it is I'm doing, all I'm looking to do is to improve every day. And sometimes it's like snakes and ladders, right? So you, <laughs> you play the game, one of the most frustrating games in the world. I, I played it with our kids. I have two kids as well. Uh, four and six and snakes and ladders is this game where you have this board it looks a bit like um, like a chess board but smaller uh, cross squares i could say and you have a dice and you have a piece and the idea is you throw the dice to reach the top and you exit the game the challenge is, is that if you throw a certain number you may end on a ladder now that ladder when you hit it it takes you up or you might get to the very end and hit a snake that will bring you all the way down. It's so frustrating. This game can take minutes or hours or days, right? So life is like that, you know? So you have good days, you have bad days. And it's about, you know, just that will to keep on going that one more day. So I'll give you an example. Um, so, so growing up, as you can see, I'm a black guy. And um, I grew up, uh, children's times I mentioned, at school, I was one of the only black kids for the first uh, 14 years of school. Now, I grew up in the UK, and um, what I believed was in, the, in a Caucasian um, set of values, a Caucasian set of values in terms of how we look. So now, I didn't look like my friends. You know, my nose is like this. My lips are like this, you know. Uh, I felt that I got this pointed head. I've got this narrow face, and, and I didn't look like my friends. So what happened was that I went through some deep, dark moments where for hours on end, I would be in my room. No one would know this. I was, I was an, I'm an introvert, extrovert. So in my introverted days, I would be in my room with a mirror 
pulling myself apart. I'm going to change my nose. I'm going to have a nose job. I'm have a lip job. I would do this, right? Where you Now, by doing this, <laughs> it narrows my nose, right? So I'd walk around like this. <laughs> so, but what happened is that some of those days I went so low, right? I, I, I did think about suicide. Like I went so, so low. And I remember at the bottom, what I felt was the bottom of this abyss, of this world that had no end. You know, in there, because all the voices in my head were telling me, you're not good enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough, right? But in there, I found one day sitting there, I found this, this voice. It was the first time that I heard it or remember hearing it. And it was this supportive voice, which said, Rob, <laughs> never, never forget it, right? It said, Rob, just look after your skin, <laughs> right? Rob, just look after your skin, I was there going like, what, what the hell? All the voices in my head, there's one saying, Rob, just look after your skin. But here's the thing. This voice was warm. It was supportive. It wasn't pulling me apart. It was, it was trying to pick me up. Now, we all have voices in our head. But it, what, what determines our life is the voice that we listen to. Now, that's a voice I heard for the very first time in that children's home, in the room, by myself, while contemplating suicide, right? because of the way that I looked and I found that voice and I decided, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I made a decision. I'm going to start to listen to that voice. And slowly, slowly, as I began to listen to that voice, you know, because sometimes all you need is just one thing to get you through that day. So starting off, listening to that voice, set up a chain reaction. That voice led me then to listen to inspirational talks led me to listen to inspirational speakers, led me to realizing you know, that the friends that I was hanging out with were not bringing me up. They were pulling me down. So then I began to look for friends or people that would contribute, people that have a, have a good energy, right? An energy that you feel like, hey, I, that guy's got a can-do energy, right? So I would look out, I would seek out those sorts of people and I would distance myself from people that I knew were taking me down. You know, in the children's home, as I said, I was an introvert at home. I was the youngest one. I was bullied. There was racism. There was all sorts of things going on. But, but what I was able to do is that I was able to see the, just the choices and decisions that people made the outcome of that person's decision. And I saw it every day. So now when you combine these things together of, of looking for the voice in you, which is trying to pull you up and then looking for the people around me who can support that. And then looking for those experiences that can also support that. So it was like a step by step by step by step process with at the root mastery and snakes and ladders, right? I, some days you're gonna have some great days and some days the days are gonna feel like, are gonna feel like hell, literally. But it's just that understanding that life is like snakes and ladders, right? You just have to keep in the game. And even, even, if, even if it's, you know, one word from somebody can change your life. One word that you hear um, for an inspirational talk can change your life. Because every day you have an opportunity to start your life again. Every day, every moment, it's just a decision that you, that you need to make. And just... Just to alliterate that, Speak Up Monday, the inspirational Q&A that we're up to, it's a weekly, we're up to number, almost up to number 100. So it's been almost two years. Every Monday, it started because Monday is the day where most people, and I had three friends who committed suicide and no one ever saw it coming. No one ever saw it coming. So the, the, the fundamental essence and drive of that show is on Monday, the day where people who contemplate um, suicide, that, that's the busiest day, right? To, to create, you know, uh, a ripple effect of positivity. Because I knew, because I had been there, right? That one word can change someone's life. One word, one conversation can, uh, can be the pattern interrupt. One person needs to hear that day. When they hear it that day, it can change the rest of their, of their lives. So, so yeah, Cam, that's a bit of a long-winded way to answer the question, but I think in there, in there somewhere, there's some breadcrumbs. 
No, that's fantastic. And I, I appreciate that because it definitely is. It's interesting that despite being from all different walks of life, a lot of us have similar experiences and similar struggles and similar pains in that. Um, and the root causes might be somewhat different, right? For you, it was that insecurity is about your body and wanting to change that to feel accepted. Um, whereas for me, it was like, I just, I couldn't do sports. I couldn't do any of that athleticism. We were so poor that I couldn't afford to get like good at any of these sports either. Um, and so I was one of those kids that even was picked on by nerds. And I remember all the time, like, going out to recess, for example, and I would get a ball that I had saved up all my money for, like uh, one of the, do you, do you know what four square is? No, no. So it's where you literally have four squares and you basically smack it in the other score, uh, square that uh, another person is in. And if they can't hit it to another square, then they're out. Or if they can't get it within the, the four squares somewhere. Uh, so if they hit it in their square or if they are not able to get it, then they're out. But so I would save up the money to get this the ball. And then unfortunately, um, I would have the kids that would decide to steal that and then say like horrific things like, hey, we're not going to play with you until you leave. Um, or we're not going to play the game at all. Um, and then they would end up stealing it. I would never get it back. And then I would get home and get ridiculed by my parents and degraded because of the fact that, uh, sorry, my daughter's coming. <laughs> Hello. Hey, you can have one maybe in the morning. You need to get back to bed, please. <laughs> you gotta love it. Uh, and of course they're taking advantage of it because right now because i'm right <laughs> in the middle of this so they're like we're we're gonna ask all the stuff that we know that we can't normally get away with we're gonna we're trying to get away with it right now a little extortionist but Love it'll be it. great more of Love negotiators it. later but <laughs> hey girls please go back to your bed now, please ask you nicely. Please don't let make that enough. That's not nice to not listen. Okay. Please go brush your teeth again. All right, because you had other food, and then go back to bed. Okay. <laughs> um. Of course, now they're flipping on lights and that. <laughs> <laughs> I love kids, and I know that they, they, they know exactly. Here, I'm going to pause it real quick, and then we will read yeah, right good. back. All right. Welcome back, you guys. I, I apologize about that. My kids will probably and disturb again just because I, I had to give them some snacks to keep the beast at bay for a moment. Um, Feed the beast. Yeah, I know. It's it's like the wolf stand over here. Um, but I, I'm definitely the, <laughs> the prey in this arrangement. Um, but, yeah, the... <laughs> You were talking about um, just the, the trials and so forth. And um, it, it's it just intriguing. Like everybody I, I feel has these challenges, whether it's um, discrimination based on color, discrimination based on physical ability, discrimination based on this, people will always find excuses to put down others um, or to make themselves feel superior. And that's really sad. It, it really is unfortunate that that's um, what things come down to. Uh, but you're right. You're you're 100 correct that when it gets down to it. Give Dad a hug. Brush your teeth. Okay. Um, so as you can see, this is the mischievous one again. I was back in the picture, <laughs> but uh, okay. Okay, but um, anyways, we're uh, I, I, I just think it's funny that uh, 
but it, well, it's not really funny, but it, it is intriguing that uh, the way that people decide to handle different things. Um, and we often find like later in life, you find out that those people that are discriminatory or putting you down or affecting you is often A, yourself, and then B, those that are in, also in pain. And so they are handling their pain by destroying others to make themselves feel better, or you are destroying yourself because of insecurity inside of you. And mm -hmm. uh, it's through that pain and also being humiliated and insulted by others that you gain a deeper understanding for those that are struggling or those that are being um, uh, that, that are being discriminated against or being put into a, an unfortunate situation. And I think that's really, and I, I just, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's contributed to a lot of what your mission has been about and helping other people and persevering through that pain and struggles to be the best person you can be. And that um, just because bad things happen to you doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that all life is out to get to you. You cannot change the actions of anybody around you. The only thing that you can change is how you react to it. So are you taking every situation and using it as a learning experience to enable you for the positive and use it to grow and to put helium or, or, or helium in your balloon and wood on your fire? Because it is gas, right? It is um, horrific uh, fuel that has to burn in order to lift you up. And now we have the second one. This is- Second one coming in? Yeah, the second. Okay. Did you brush your teeth? Okay. Um, so the, the advantages of being a dad um, entrepreneur is uh, right. you don't get a break. You don't get a break at all. Um, dadpreneur. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Go get that. I'll check in later. Okay. Are you going to be good? All right. Hopefully that's the last of them. <laughs> yeah. I will Maybe. We, we, should, we shall see. So, so that what you were talking into before is, uh, is uh, it's a superpower that we can all cultivate. And that superpower is empathy. Right, empathy. So there's sympathy, then there's empathy. So I'll give you a very quick story. So when I was 12, right, uh, in, in, in London, now the N word I won't mention on, on, on the show, but yeah, I could. Please don't. Anyway. I, I don't want to have it restricted. <laughs> no, there you go. So, so basically, I was with a friend and we're walking down, down the street. There's, there's another, let's say, person of color. And we're walking past the pub. And this guy just said, Oi, N word, go back to your own country. Right. And this guy came running out. Now, what happened next, I was not expecting. So this guy hit me. I fall down. This friend of mine hits him. He falls down. Three more guys come running out, out of this pub. And then I start to run. And I'm running, running. And I'm thinking, you know, this friend of mine, Andy, is with me, right? And then as I'm running and I feel like I'm being chased, um, I, I turn around and realize that he's not there. And then the worst thing happens is that then I, I look a bit further away and I realize that there's someone on the floor curled up in a ball in the fetal position, protecting all of the vital parts like their head and their ribs. And now there's about eight the 10 guys kicking him, right? Now, I walk back and the guys come and chase me again, but I know they can't catch me, so they leave me alone. I can hear the sound of the boots connecting with his body, right? I can see like the anger and hatred in their eyes as they're kicking him. Now, I'm there thinking, I'm shocked. I'm 12 years of age. I was, I was a tough kid, but I wasn't prepared for that. I didn't, have, I didn't have what was necessary to deal with that situation. 
But what I do understand is that if I go back there, then I could be dead. If I stand where I am, then I'm being a coward and I'm not sure if I could ever forgive myself for that. So now the brain, fight, flight, or freeze. I didn't fight. I didn't flight. I froze. But I could see everything. I could hear everything. And I could see him wincing in pain, every, every kick. This goes on for probably a couple of minutes. It feels like an eternity. Out of the pub come more guys. And I'm thinking, they're here to help. They pull the guys aside. Yeah, but they're not there to help. They then kick him as well. So now there's more than 10 guys. And this is going, and within me, something is breaking. Right? Something is breaking. The, the way which I can describe it to you is a bit like, um, you know, the Cowboys and the Indians, right? In the UK, we were told about the Cowboys and the Indians, that the Cowboys were the good guys and the Indians were the savages. Obviously, um, that wasn't the case. So it was like part of my innocence and part of my youth with every kick they laid into him was being taken away from me. So, so what ended up happening, and I go to this in a lot more detail in the book, Soul Survivor, how an abandoned child goes from nothing to everything, published by New Holland. But what happens is that these girls come out and they shame these guys into stopping. And then, and then look, there's more to that story. But the point I want to make is, is this. For the days that moved after that, I was filled with anger, hatred, jealousy, but more directed at myself because I wasn't able to do what I thought I would be able to do in that situation, which was protect myself and protect others. And I wasn't able to do it. I failed miserably, right? And, and I couldn't forgive myself. So that's why I, I wanted to find that guy. And I, I wanted to inflict more pain on him than I could ever experience myself to get it out of my body. It is so uncomfortable, that feeling, right, to have in my body. It was there for days. So... Some months before that, we were in history studying the Hundred Years' War. It was, a, it was a war that went on for 100 years in the Middle East. A kid behind me puts his hand up, says, this, yeah, Hundred Years' War, yeah. It can't be the same people fighting, can it? And so I didn't get it. I didn't get it. But fast forward some months to, th to about two or three days after that incident, I got this incredible insight and I realized the Hundred Years' War is not the same people fighting at all. It's the hatred, the anger, uh, the beliefs passed down from one generation to the next that keeps it going. So what I realized was I had a choice to make there and then that I could either be part of the problem or part of the solution. So I could go back, I could find that guy. Let's say I found him and I kicked 10 bells of hell out of that guy. What would that really achieve? Short term, maybe I would feel better about it. But longer term, I'm just contributing to the same problem that, that allowed him to arrive there at the same time. So in later years, I realized that as human beings, we are doing the best we can with what we have at all times. And as a kid, I have kids, you have kids. Zero to seven is a fatal brainwave. We're sponges for accepting, imbibing all of the, the thoughts, ideologies, impressions, worldview of our caregivers. And based upon that, our life establishes like this, this railway track that goes off into our future subconsciously that we're not even aware of. So that guy who started a fight with me for no apparent reason, really, I was just walking down the street, right? He had his own life where probably his parents passed on to him. you got to hate people for the color of their skin, for this, for that, for that, for this, and so on. So he was just living out his subconscious programming on me. So once I got that, I realized, right, that I can be part of the problem or part of the solution. And 
The solution is empathy. Empathy is understanding that this guy is doing the best he can with what he knows right now. Right now. And what he happens to know is limited and is basically, it's, uh, it's constricted by those impressions, ideologies, experiences, thoughts, worldview that he or she grew up around. And all they can do is repeat those patterns unless something happens to cause them to think and to stop. Once I got that, I knew that what, what my mission was, was about embracing diversity and inclusion, about bridging the gap between, at that time, black and white. Because I grew up black man, almost like in a white man's brain, right? I, my values were Caucasian. You know, I would speak on the phone to people, and when they would meet me in real life, they'd be like, oh, I thought you were a white guy. <laughs> so, so I understood both worlds. And later on, I failed some exams. I had to go back to college, and that college was 99% black. I had the biggest culture shock you can imagine. But, but that, those two things gave me something really special. And that, that special, unique, ability to see people for people not for the color not for the the beliefs political or otherwise that they come in with and to hold empathy as one of my highest values which allows you to connect with anyone at any time and the last thing i would say is that so for the last 25 years i i have not experienced racism at all now, am I saying that racism doesn't exist? No, I'm not. But what I'm saying is I haven't experienced it at all. Why? Because there's nowhere for it to sit or to hook or to be embraced in my whole body, mind, energy, because I've processed it. I understand exactly what it is. And, and I understand that it's about conditioning. So because I understand that, I don't blame the person. I point at the conditioning which allows me to have empathy and to forgive. Not necessarily to forget, but to forgive. So empathy um, is really the key, I think, to unlocking, you know, like the, the potential of what we can do together as a collaboration and together as we can, as, as a human race, as a species on the planet. So collaboration, but empathy is, is, is the number one, the number one value. Well, there's a saying that uh, an eye for the eye makes the whole world blind. Yeah. And, um, it, and that's obviously by Gandhi. And I think he was a brilliant man on a number of different levels. But uh, the, and to your point, yes, the, the reason is not that you don't experience racism and racism yeah. exists across the board, right? Um, discriminating against anybody of any color is, is racist. And it, it's it only you, it only affects you when you let it. And I, I think you're a living testament of that. It, and yes, there is oh, unfortunately a lot of people that uh, that think that um, based on your your color determines your challenges that you're going to have in life. But half the challenges, at least in my mind, it's in here. And yeah. all you can conquer and be the master of this world, you'll never be the master of the exterior world. Um, and uh, I, I know that uh, that uh, it, it seems like, it, so uh, I don't really talk about this a lot at all, um, but I, I was uh, put through a lot of unfortunate experiences. Um, even to the extent that uh, I had to get into several malpractice lawsuits against legal entities and that because uh, needless to say, long story short, I was arrested for false accusations. So I got to learn firsthand um, some of the corruption and the mistreatment in our justice system. And I realized that it wasn't necessarily, it was people basically justifying their selfish interest um, and exporting the less fortunate um, because they knew that I wouldn't be able to afford a decent lawyer. I wouldn't be able to really fight the charges or anything else. And it got to the point where I was threatened that says, hey, either you take this plea bargain 
um, and plead to charges that you did not commit or you spend at mm. least five years in prison. Wow. And I was like, what kind of choice is that? Admit mm. something that I did not do or spend in prison. Um, and so, and I learned that that's almost a very common story, especially with poverty. Um, mm. People that get extorted because, um, and I, I also learned that in the police department, they intentionally target people yep. with poverty because they know that you're not going to be able to afford a lawyer. They know that there's an, mm. an increased likelihood that they are going to have a number of uh, higher citations or convictions against you. And um, you're not going to fight it in court. So 80 something percent, over, almost 90% of all criminal cases never actually go to court. So they get settled prior to court. 80%, 90%. Yeah. Yeah. And almost 20% of those um, are estimated to be, have never committed the crime. Mm -hmm. um, which is why I became so passionate about eliminating policing for profit policies because mm -hmm. I understood and it made sense to me like so I've seen both sides right I've seen why people are so angry and absolutely hate law enforcement because mm -hmm. they see them as the enemy they see them as mm -hmm. people that are just trying to extort their way but I've also seen the good mm. people that are trying to make a change, that are trying to change that culture. Mm. And that's when it really set in that people do not change. It doesn't matter the environment. It doesn't matter the religion. It doesn't matter what they're claimed to be, what they're a part of. People do not change at all. Um, and those people can either be positive and be inspiration to trying to solve the problems, or they can be negative. And to put assumptions on anybody, regardless of color, background, whatever, is no different than profiling, say, all Catholics as, as pedophiles. It's yeah. absolutely ignorant and foolish to do so. And it's, it shows your own ignorance and you contributing to the problem because you're contributing to the hate and the misinformation and the judgment because mm. nobody likes to be judged, right? And you're, you're right. It's meeting with empathy and understanding and condemning the hate and those that are clearly have shown their actions because they don't know a better way. But it's still having yeah. empathy for those people to say, look, uh, and that was a hard thing for me, especially against some of the, like, the officers that wrongfully accused and then lied. Um, mm -hmm. That was very hard for me because at that point I saw them as, I was like, no, you are trying to destroy my life. You're trying to take my life away from me. Um, mm. And that was a very hard time thing to have empathy for, right? Mm -hmm. It's very hard to have compassion towards anyone that would mean that type of physical, mental, or monetary harm to you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same thing. I still have difficulty um like even right now because people see that i have company vehicles at my house and so forth it becomes a target where people mm. constantly steal things and break into my vehicles and smash the property in that and they think oh yeah well insurance will cover it and they don't know mm. that I, if i file a claim my insurance goes up so i can't make the claim yeah. and so I have to still suffer for that, but their ignorance to that, to that in their entitlement. Um, and it's not mm. justified. And I actually had to talk myself into this mentality of like, man, I, I really hope that they needed those tools more than I did. Mm. I really hope that maybe they just have a mouth to feed. And that's the only way mm. that they know how to get by in their current stage of life. Mm. You know, it's, mm. Well, I was just saying that there, there's, there was so much of me that wanted to, to hurt that person, just like you said, right? Yeah. To, to make them feel the pain in that because they didn't understand that they almost had made me homeless a couple of times because they took my ability away from me to work 
with my own hands to provide mm. and bring that money in because I couldn't do the jobs. Mm. And so that was a very hard obstacle that I, I still to this day struggle to get over. Um, mm. But like you said, it's a constant, it's a constant journey, right? And it's just like that snakes and ladders. Some days you will be able to choose the high road. And there's other times in that that you just let those instantaneous moments drag you down oh. a few layers and you uh, let out a few choice words about them and just have to vent it and get it off your chest. And that because we let that consume us. But it's the moment that we embrace it and say, you know what, I can't let this person's actions affect my life and let mm -hmm. me contain. Because as you, we were in our earlier discussion too, you pointed out that retaining that contention and that hate doesn't do anything to them. All it does is destroy you. It only hurts yeah. you. Yeah. You're only, so you are the only victim. And by victimizing yourself, you're just continuing the victim cycle, which means that you stay in this hole and never get out of it. You can never save never yourself. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, it's such a powerful thing, you know, like uh, there's this word called systemic racism or systemic you know so and this is what i mean it, it's like the people are only doing what they're programmed to do now again i may not like that i may not agree with that um i may not forgive that but i can accept that so then if i really want to seek a solution then the solution is the system that creates a problem so, so if I really want to, you know, if I really want to um, create a solution, I have to go to the system, not the people, because the people are just a product of the system. And, um, you know, and, and that thing you mentioned earlier on about, you know, that people don't, don't, don't change. You know, I understand that. Uh, what I would say, though, is that with increasing frequency, certain people which would never think could change are changing right and and you know like as I, as I think I mentioned earlier on I see that in many many ways life is working for you not against you it doesn't mean that the experiences that come up are, are not going to be uncomfortable as you said also it doesn't mean it's going to be like a nice easy easy kind of stroll into the park not at all but when you look back, you begin to see the relevance and significance of that thing happening. I'll give you an example. You know, like there's a, there's a guy which I know. He, he hasn't always played by the law, right? And he's done some things which I actually do not agree with at all. And, but, you know, this guy had a near-death experience. And, and what happened from that is that he got a real sense of his own mortality. And with that sort of a chain reaction of him beginning to understand, you know, that he's hurting people for no reason. So ultimately, what's happening now to this, to this particular person is that, is that he's on a chain reaction of change, you know, a chain reaction of change. And he is amending his behavior and he's beginning to take responsibility for some of the things that he's done. And is trying to make amends for that, you know. So, so I don't know where this guy's going to end up, but the but the, the early signs look very promising that this guy is making a real change. So, so I never. So know, I should I clarify my earlier point. When I say people don't change, I mean that just because they claim to be a part of a church or because they claim to oh, be, I see. and that doesn't mean that the people are different or anything. Just because you have okay. money doesn't mean, mean you're a good or bad person. Just because you claim to be Christian doesn't mean you're a good or bad person. Just because you're white or black or yellow or whatever yeah. doesn't mean you're a good or bad person. And you yeah. have all these different sections. Um, you have people that are homeless, that are vile, discriminate, like horrible murderers, thieves and everything else. But you also have homeless people that are the most compassionate giving people that even though they have nothing they are still willing to give the very clothes off their back to help you mm. to ease your pain and that i mm. have so much admiration for and that's why some of the best people i've ever met 
were homeless because, and I had more respect for them just because they already had nothing. They had mm. nowhere lower to go, right? Besides death or six feet under. That is the only lower point that they could really get. When you're in dumpster diving for a meal, you know things are bad, right? Mm. But I've also seen the same evil and greatness in some rich people. And, I, mm. and yes, it's different level because when a rich person gives money or whatever else, yes, they contribute jobs. They contribute uh, a great work environment. They contribute to charities and so forth to benefit more people overall. Um, what I wouldn't consider that more um, necessarily, but I would still consider them good, which is why I'm saying that there's, there's that good still at that level, but there's also the mm. evil people that use their money to extort to bribe, to manipulate, to mm. be dishonest and just horrible people. And that's why mm. I said uh, people don't change. The individual can change, but status and everything else does not affect the level or caliber of a person. Mm. So hopefully that clarifies. Mm. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'll let you take the floor now. <laughs> you were on a roll. And I apologize for throwing off the vibe. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. Uh, I, I think the role, that the, the role has finished for that particular point, right? Uh, which, which, you've, which you've just clarified again. You know, it's a, you know, like, it, it's, it's a system, you know, behind the people. I mean, I grew up, you know, b believing, you know, with the Caucasian um, values of beauty because I was sucked in by the system. You know, I was the only black kid at school, one of the only black kids at school for a, a period of time. Um, what I saw on TV, uh, the magazines that I read, front covers that I saw, everything was pushed towards that. You know, and, and just to finish that story, um, so this belief of not looking um, good enough, uh, of not being enough, you know, followed me. Uh, I became a model, right? And, um, and, and the model thing was searching for exterior validation to make me feel good interiorly. So in other words, you know, if I look good on the external, then I'll feel good on the internal. That's, that was the modus operandi that I was working towards without realizing, but that's what was going on. So I ended up, in, in Italy, in the, uh, the capital, in a place called Milano. And, and I got a few incredible breaks, incredible breaks. That's a whole other story. And, and it ended up that, that I ended up working with the supermodels. The supermodels um, were the first um, models who made modeling a global phenomenon. People like Naomi Campbell, Ava Herzegova, Linda Evangelista, Cindy Crawford. There's a guy called Marcus Schreckenberg. So I worked with these, with these people doing fashion shows in Milan. And I remember one show, which was with Naomi Campbell, Swiss Jeans in Milan, right? And I remember, you know, like being one of the first models out and, and just realizing at the moment before I was due to go on stage, but all of the, all of the, the skeletons in the closet the feelings of not being good enough, feeling good enough, looking good enough, all of these feelings that I was holding at arm's length, right, began to come back. Remember, on one sense, I'm on cloud nine. I'm working with the best, most famous models in the world uh, in the place that is known to be almost like the center of fashion in the world. So I, I can't get higher than that. So I'm at the highest level possible. So I'm proud of myself. I'm at the highest level possible and thinking that, yeah, I've got this down. Not realizing that inside of me is still the 10, 12-year-old kid, you know, who doesn't believe that he looks good enough or is enough. Who's pretending, thinking that for external validation that I'm going to be good. So now I'm about to go on and all of these feelings of not being good enough, not feeling good enough, not looking, not looking good enough, came back. At that moment, I realized that I was living a lie. I realized, yeah, that 
looking for the external validation to give me um, the feeling of completeness or fulfillment inside didn't work. <laughs> so, so then even though I still went on stage and I, and I did my thing, doing the actor thing that I can do, you know, I realized it didn't work. And from that moment, I realized that the only way I could go was inside, not outside. And then that's where a whole different um, life unfolded for me, which was more of an inner journey than an outward journey. Because I realized that the outward going in doesn't work. So the only other way I could look would be inside. So I began to meditate. I began to go deeper down that rabbit hole to where I began to really begin and learn self-love and acceptance for who I was, what I looked like, and, and, uh, and, and to forgive myself, uh, self-love, self-forgiveness. Um, these are the things that I began to find that really um, began to um, unleash or unlock those abilities within me to connect to people. Because when you can connect with yourself, when you learn to love yourself for all of the things that you don't necessarily like, when you learn to love and accept yourself, and that is a journey of mastery as well. doesn't stop. But when you learn to start that journey, when you can accept yourself, then you can accept others. And, and, and that, that little experience there, um, Swiss Jeans, Milan, 1998 with Naomi Cameron and a whole bunch of other models before, about to be the first one on stage to a packed house. Um, you know, that's what that, that experience gave me. Well, I think from our, our chat rooms and so forth uh, and the, all the conversations we've had before, it, it's, and anybody, honestly, that's watching the video podcast of this right now, I don't think anybody's shocked that you were a model at some point. Um, I would have to pay people to put this mug on anything. Um, <laughs> I've got but, some money here. Yeah. Uh, but you're, you're 100% right. Um, the only time that I was able to really get past those inner demons and that we always think that self exterior modification changes everything else and that validation um, is what we need, right? Is like, if I just had this, these modifications or anything, um, and it even goes to the extent of some of the people that have done sex changes and so forth, because they think that if I just have this, then that will give me the validation I need to be like set here and happy mm -hmm. up here. And, and reality is that, yes, it does boost you up at front and that for a little bit, right? It gives you that like honeymoon effect for sometimes yeah. it lasts a couple of months. Sometimes it lasts a few years and that, but then all those demons start to come out again, those skeletons, those insecurities and everything all crawl back out because you haven't faced them ha ha like hands on. And I use that metaphor that all you've done is put a dead body and wall it up in one side of your house. Eventually the stink from that dead body is going to come through that wall and ruin the rest of the house. Eventually it will. Eventually, you have to destroy that wall, tear it down, clean out all that rot and decay and that smell and everything else, get it out of your house, accept it for what it is in your home and that, address it head on, get it out, and then you can rebuild. And then you can begin new. And then you can have that full house, if you will, and that clean house and that dream home that you always wanted. And I had to realize that I had to accept because there was a lot of things. The immediate impulse, right, is you have these horrible thoughts and um, and the automatic like that, whether it's committing violence against the people that have wronged you or um, about the evils of what you were capable of. And it's not saying to embrace the thoughts of what that is, but you have to accept what you are capable of. And what your actions have been both your past present and your future and become basically it, it say you know what this is me i accept this but i refuse to be part of this energy because i know this is the direction i want this is the path i want to take so you, 
if you, for example, think about it this way, you can take a house and you can take the root bones of it. And if you let it dissolve and decay in it, you can turn it into a haunted house and you can use it as a, uh, a network or a possibility of uh, like a haunted mansion or amusement park or something like that. You can also take that same house and turn it into a luxury home full of the highest amenities and everything. The only determination is you, what you're willing to put into mm. it, what you are willing to do it. The foundation is there. The possibility is there. The only change again is you and what you want in your life. And so anytime somebody is like, well, I just don't have that in my cards. I don't have that possibility. It's not like I've done too many mistakes. I'm unforgivable or anything else. I was like, find me a home that is really necessarily um, that even the land isn't salvageable or something to where you can't renovate and turn it into a dream home. I mean, there's mm. homeless. So think of it and be the renovator of your own life, if that makes sense. Love it. Yeah. Love it. You know, and, and, you know, the, the other thing, you know, the, that comes in is that, you know, you just start where you are. You just start where, where you are. Oftentimes, you know, on this inspirational show called Speak Up Monday that we do, Speak Up Monday group on Facebook, if you want to see it, Speak Up Monday group. You know, what I love about it is, you know, is that we get this opportunity to uncover what's beneath the hood of somebody who has done something great. And in a way that the questions are posed, just like you're doing with me now, is that you know, we get to the heart and soul of what makes somebody tick. And at that heart and soul of, of what makes somebody tick, what I've always noticed is this sense of, you know, starting where you are. So starting where you are today and making, even if it's one adjustment. And that's an excellent example. One step too. in the direction. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, so I believe that you become good the same way that you become bad. It's shades of gray. Mm. It's not overnight. Mm. It's not like we can necessarily put bleach in that, but if we don't have the right foundation, and to clarify that my earlier point is sometimes the foundation of your home, you damage so much to the point and basically your friends and your life choices and the people around you are almost essentially the foundation or the lot that you've placed your house on. If that's not unstable, if there's nuclear waste all throughout that house, then chances are it's a good thing just to condemn it and move on and get a new fresh start. Um, because if you do not address that, right, if you don't cut those toxic people out of your life, then you will basically your property value and everything is never going to amount to anything. Mm. Uh, use it as, as simple as a metaphor of that. Um, because one thing that I found is I always felt like, hey, even though I'm not doing, say, these drugs or whatever, I'm not doing it, but my friends were doing it. And maybe I can help be that influence for them um, to be better, to improve them. But by choosing yeah. to associate in that, it was actually doing the opposite. It was enabling them. It was continuing the cycle. Mm. It was actually acting as an anchor for me. And you can't mm. save yourself when you have an anchor tied to your leg and you're 20 feet underwater. Yeah. You need to yeah. cut that anchor loose, get to the mm. surface, get the right tools and equipment, and then provide the tools to, for the people that want to save themselves. They can but the only true way that you can inspire change in others is by continuing on without them and hoping that they'll catch up. It's not to say that completely disregard them, but you've got to understand like uh, there were so many people that would ask for favors constantly and handouts and all of this other stuff. And I felt like I had to, like I felt like that was necessary, but by doing that, I was enabling them to just continue where, where they were at. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't forcing them 
as uncomfortable as it made me and as uncomfortable as it made them. And they said all sorts of profane things. I learned that I had to cut that tie completely and utterly cold turkey, like no association, no contact, no nothing, because I'm like, I refuse to associate with that crowd anymore. I refuse to continue allowing myself to be dragged down. I am worth more than mm-hmm. I have more potential than this. And I want more than what this life is offering right now. And so once I accepted that and understood that, and I bulldozed that whole lot, moved on to a new lot <laughs> with new friends, new associations, new work acquaintances and everything. And I created this new tribe and refused to allow those old connections in. Funny mm. things happened. A lot of those people mm. turned their life around. They were bitter at me for the longest time, but then I look back in that. Some of them did. Other people actually went down the opposite way. They were dead in jail or whatever else, similar to your, your foster home. But that was their choice. And mm. I'm not responsible for their choices, right? The only thing I can be responsible for is mine and how I react to it. And thank heavens like some of those people that were um and that was kind of the validation at least for me the true validation for some of the choices that i had made was one of some of these people came back is like hey you know i was mad at you for like cutting off from me and not talking for the longest time but thank you for like teaching me what could be and that what you could get to which gave me hope for what the possibility of what i could have Love it. family and kids it. and all of that and mm. um, and and it's not to say i'm perfect it's like you said it's always an ever and never-ending journey towards mastery towards striving towards just be better than what we were yesterday and sometimes mm. we step back a few steps but um hopefully we we launch some of those ladders and really the ladders in life are people better than us we always try to find those people that we can surround ourselves by that are better than us that can provide us the skills that perspective and i can definitely say mm. that you are already one of those ladders in my life to give me that new perspective that new um that positivity if you will mm. love it brother love it and you know what? I, I, I love what I love you and what you're doing, man. Like we've just met, um, but your you know your your energy, your approach, outlook, you know how you lift people up, inspire people, you know through doing things like this. But just hearing your story on on, on Clubhouse just resonated so deeply with me because it's like, you know, I saw you know another soul on the planet that's trying to raise the consciousness of other souls, you know, you, you, you are a, a huge container, you know, who has the ability to positively impact a great number of people. And, and I love the fact that you're doing that. I also love the fact that we have tools like Clubhouse, tools like Zoom, um, all the social media, you know, it's funny, you know, like years ago, I was so anti-social media, you know, my generation is like, you know, we don't do that stuff. We, we shake someone's hand, we look them in the eye, right? That's our generation. And, um, and I used to run nightclubs for a long time, 20 years or something. And, and the, what I loved was that personal connection I had with people, right? And they loved it too. And, you know, I, I, I failed to see how this thing called social media could do that. And so I remember I had one conversation with a guy called Grant Lewis. Lewis, interesting name. So he toured with Tony Robbins, the big speaker, and he was known as Little Tony. He looks a bit similar, but a bit smaller. And uh, he used to do the kids, while the other guys, uh, Tony would do the adults. And so, so what would happen is that, um, you know, that we had this one conversation. He goes, Rob, do you understand the power of social media? And I said, yeah, of course I do. He goes, you don't, do you? I said, no, I don't. And this one conversation that he had with me was he said, Rob, what it is is a tool And it's a tool, all the things that you are doing now in the offline world, you can do on the online world and impact more people, right? So when you can accelerate, just like money. Yes, exactly. It can accelerate the good in you or the bad in you. 
Especially exactly. with the algorithm, so, the way social media works. It's so intriguing yeah. because if you react yeah. to all the positive, if you engage on all the negative on your Facebook feed, that's what it's going to show you more of. And so it's actually bringing yeah. you more and more to the point that eventually your feed, your entire feed will just be negativity and conspiracies and all this just negative, awful energy. And that's essentially what it consumes yeah. you as. But as you make pivot right. and changes, the algorithm will change. And then the only thing you'll see is positive. So it's intriguing that you change that mindset in what you choose to engage with. And that determines what you will see and how you perceive that world, which goes back to our, our, your earlier point. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, you absolutely nailed it. And this is what Grant was saying. And after this 10-minute conversation, I was like, ding, a little light went off. And I realized that... The, that, that I can use the tool in the best way possible to impact people. Once I got that, then I think it was within two weeks, I had like 5,000 friends and, and, and so on and so on. But the thing was, was it's just that understanding to embrace technology, but keep the fundamental essence of what it is and who you are. And if you're like us, you have this mission, right? to impact people in a positive, powerful way, then whether it be Clubhouse, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is, these are just vehicles and tools for us. Accelerator, as you, as you put it, I'll use that word for now on, thank you very much. But it's an accelerator for us to impact and reach more people. You know, so, so, so yeah, so, so don't be afraid, um, you know, to, even if you don't know what you're doing, right? We, none of us know what we're doing, but we're learning as we go. It's about mastery, again, Right. So don't be hard on yourself. I mean, as a parent, right? And we had a chat about this the other day. Parents is like, oh my God, you know, we look at our kids and we go, and we just realize like, oh, they picked that up from me. They picked that one up from mom. I have no idea where they picked that one up from. Right. But they're a product of their environment, right? And, and so so being it's a parent, parent it's always too. parent that they pick it up from. It's mastery. Yeah. And, and like, you know, and you realize, you know, don't give yourself such a hard time. You know, like there, there's no one, you know, in a bush, you know, waiting there with a, with, with a, you know, parent of the month award for this month. The parent of the month award goes to Cameron and jumps out from a bush and hands you this medal saying, what you did for the last month with your kids was amazing, right? It doesn't exist. And, and by, by the contrary to that, there's no one hanging in a bush saying, hey, mate, how you just handled your six-year-old wasn't wasn't really good was it right like you could have done better <laughs> right? i think we all have so, that voice and everything that definitely speaks yeah, to us and that they're like hey you know what you just kind of did something that your parents used to do and you didn't like it like you, you need to change and that's why i think that yeah. some of that negativity is allowed to happen to you good people right a lot of that negative yeah. and that downward stuff is does is allowed to destroy some really good people. But the thing is, is it actually adds to our life. It's a blessing. And some of those trials and those tribulations, like at that time, it was hell. It was literally hell on earth. I mean, fighting every day to get a gun out of your mouth or to struggle just to get through the next day and wondering why on earth that this stuff is happening to you. Why, why me, right? What did I do to deserve this? What did I do yeah. to deserve all this pain and strife and so forth? And so sometimes you almost react to it negatively and you're like, you know what? If I deserve this, then I might as well deserve this, right? It's like when you got in trouble for something you didn't do, and you're like, well, then I might as well have done it. I remember when I used to get, mm. you know, spanked in that uh, by my uh, parents and that uh, for, for hitting my brothers or something and I hadn't hit them. And I was like, you know what? I, one of these times I'm going to just hit him. <laughs> so I can actually deserve the punishment. Um, and, but the thing is, is if we can take some of that trials and then turn it to the positive end, just take that understanding and say, yes, I understand what it's like. I understand what it's like to suffer, to feel that pain. It then gives me the humility because if bad things only happen to bad people, then nobody would be bad. I truly believe that um, because of the fact that there would be no incentive, right? All the negative stuff would happen yeah. to bad people. 
but I think it's uh, it plays out to where both good and bad happens to both good and bad people. So that way you can truly choose which side of the fence you want to be on. But the good, and that when I, you it, I find that it's continually happiness, and you will, uh, as you choose that side, it lasts longer. Yes, it's harder to work for. It's harder work. And that's why that side is less appealing. But the fact is, is it lasts long. It's more of an endurance race, right? It's like the same reason that some people prefer the quick, get rich quick schemes. And people engage with that because they just want the results overnight. But nothing good ever came overnight, right? <laughs> Love that. You know, um, what it reminds me of is, is a practice that I'd love to share with people because uh, I think it's enormously empowering and you don't need anything, anyone. Uh, it doesn't cost any money. Uh, all you need is a mirror, right? Which most of us have in our bathroom. If you don't have a mirror, get a shop window, right? Um, so, so it's by Lisa Nichols, who is an amazing, uh, she's an amazing person, uh, a beautiful human being has a credible story and is absolutely, her mission is to inspire, uplift many people as she can. So this one, so you start off usually, like morning is a good time, but uh, if you go into your mirror, maybe after you finish brushing your teeth and, and you want to get in the Superman or Superwoman pose, what does that mean? It means that your feet a little bit more than shoulder width apart, your hands are on your the waist. There you go. So, and then you're standing up straight looking in the mirror. That is an extremely powerful position uh, in terms of setting your body up for success, right? Don't ask me how it works. I don't remember, but it works, right? What you do next is that look in the mirror and you say to yourself. So for example, my name's Rob. So I'll use me as an example. So there's three things, right? And we do them one at a time. Each one we do seven times, okay? So this is, this is me. So in the morning, I might say, so I start with my name, Rob. Rob, I am proud of you for, and you say seven things, but each one is individual. So for example, Rob, I'm proud of you for doing this incredible Q&A with this beautiful soul called Cameron. That would be one. Rob, I'm proud of you, you know, for playing with your kids last night before they went to sleep and having so much fun and joy with them that, it, that I'm sure, you know, like I felt amazing doing it, right? Two, and, and so on and so on and so on. The second one is, Rob, I forgive you for. This one is incredibly empowering because as we said before, forgiveness is the key to unlocking your potential. Because when we feel guilt, it holds us back. When we're able to forgive ourselves and we're able to kind of remove that glass ceiling of limitation to, to grow and to create something perhaps that we never saw coming. So this one is very important. So Rob, I forgive you for um, failing to keep your word with Cameron and, and being an hour late, right? To start the podcast, for example, Rob, and it can, if you can go as deep as you want or as surface as you want, it's up to you. Rob, I forgive you for you know, not hitting your financial goals yet, right? Could be one of them. Rob, so you can go as, as deep or as shallow as you want. So the first one is Rob, I'm proud of you for. You insert your own name. The second one is Rob, I forgive you for. And the third one is Rob, I commit to you that. Now this, it's good for this in maybe in the next 24 hours, right? So Rob, I commit to you that you will have an amazing podcast with Cameron. Rob, I commit to you that, you know, I've got two or three meetings pretty soon uh, to meet X and Y person and to have that difficult conversation. Rob, I commit to you that you do everything within your power to inspire as many people today as you can, right? So, so this is a declaration, right? For the next 24 hours. So those three things, remember, Superman or Superwoman pose in front of the mirror where you can see yourself, right? Three things, Rob, say your name. Rob, I'm proud of you for. Say what you're proud about. Maybe in the last 24 hours. Could be longer. That's okay. Rob, I forgive you for, right? 
So what do you forgive yourself for? Very important step. And the third one is, Rob, I commit to you that. And you give your commitment to, to, to yourself, your declaration. Uh, and for the next 24 hour or 12 hour period is really good, but it's something that you can remember. Well, and that's, I, I think those affirmations really work uh, to a certain degree. And, and it's, a lot of people don't necessarily believe in them, right? But I do see the purpose and intent behind them because it is needed for you to recognize whether that's through affirmations or whether that's through commitments or anything else on recognizing the unresolved issues. So, because if you just decide to ignore it and push it down and address it later, that's when it comes up later, whether that's in your relationship, whether it's in your personal life or whatever. So yeah. crafting it only bottles it and it leads to that contention and that negativity and that um, frustration and anger to be released in other people or other aspects of your life. And so I, mm. I think that it's very important to at least acknowledge, right, in whatever way you want to do that, whether that's through affirmations, writing it down, burning um, the frustrations and that, just writing all the downs of things that are like, hey, I'm, I'm frustrated with this. But the key, right, is not only just venting about it. It's like, what am I going to do to it about it? How can I turn this into a positive, even if it's horrible? Um, yeah. Like even when I had my knees uh, had to be rebuilt and that I was like, okay, this is, this sucks and everything. This is my frustration uh, because I can't do all of these other things. I can't be athletic as I want. I can't run as much as I want. But then I had to commit and say, well, what am I going to do about it? The positive is I'm more thankful for the body that I have, the things that are functioning correctly. I am going yeah. to commit to physical therapy so I can regain some of that functionality. And I'm going to commit to taking a deeper appreciation for my physical health and my overall wellness. So that way that I can avoid instances like this going in the future. And I'm also going to commit to help other people to avoid the mistakes I made to trash my body so bad. Mm. Mm. Powerful, Ken. Powerful. So it can be as simple as that, you know, and petty is, is a new, <laughs> new replacement, but it can also be something like, hey, you know what? I, I'm frustrated that I feel like a failure as a father that I'm not able to spend as much time, like quality time with my kids as I would like. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to commit to block out X amount of hours per week. And I'm going to break out these activities and make sure mm -hmm. the key is, is because if you don't follow through on those commitments, then you feel like a bigger failure as a man. Mm -hmm. Also have the insecurities that let dominate in your own mind because you're like man i don't believe in myself i'm not even mm. good enough to follow through on my own commitments and so whatever yeah. you need to do to create that discipline and that's why i would always recommend like when you're first starting doing some of this you set the goal small right and mm. that's no validation because as you follow through that with that commitment um that's when it gives you that self-confidence that inner confidence to say yes i can do better I can do this. Mm. I can make it. But when you set up like this night and day goal saying, hey, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z or spend an entire week with my kids and everything, that's not realistic. It really isn't, mm. especially if you are struggling yeah. with your bills or anything else. There has to be that balance. You have to see like, mm. okay, you know what? I'm going to block out this time. And part of the commitment to help me with this goal is I'm going to, when I focus on work, I'm a hundred percent on work to make sure that yeah. when I, that work does not follow me home to where I don't have to check my mm. phone every two seconds while I'm with my kids. Because how often Probably. is our phone, the distraction between and the, the disruption of why we're not spending quality time with our kids. Um, mm. and it's actually, I actually had to create the discipline because I realized that if I had it, I would not follow through with the commitment. So I had to turn it off or mute it or whatever and set it aside and down to where I couldn't even see mm -hmm. it ring. Because if I even saw it buzz in that, then my eyes would immediately be diverted yeah. to that. And that was taking it out of the moment. 
And so mm-hmm. when I was, I just had to get into that. It's like, hey, okay, when you're work, 100% work. When you're family, 100% family. And you do not let those cross or interfere with each other. Mm. Nice reminder. <laughs> so what, um, let, let's get back to kind of the, the original, um, the, I, I would say the topic, which is just kind of overcoming. I, I would say that it's uh, seeing how we can change ourselves to, to also positively impact as many others as we can. And I think also part of this contributes to um, building your tribe, right? It's, I think that's, I, I know that we didn't really choose a topic for say, but that seems like to be the core thing that we're at least discussing right now. Um, what, what would you say was the really key influential factor in how you were able to network even when you were struggling with these insecurities and so forth and these inner challenges, what was that decision that you decided, you know what, um, I am gonna at least validate myself to where I can network with these powerful people, um, which allowed you to have those great opportunities in Milan and also these business contacts that you've built going forward. What would you say is yeah. again, most contributing or beneficial thing that's been for you both mentally and physically and that that's allowed you to make those connections and make yeah. enough influence on those people that they liked and trusted you and uh, mm. became part of you. Right, so, yeah, look, let, let's unpack that. So okay. the, 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 the driving force is the power of your why. It's the driving force. So, so my why stems back to the children's home, the second children's home in London. A lot of the Sunday afternoons in our back garden, there's a huge back garden, or it felt like it was huge when you're small. And there was a game of football that you might know soccer, but it's called football. I'm an Englishman, football, not soccer. Right, uh, so football or soccer. And in our back garden, we'd have like 15 kids playing this game called knockout. Knockout, basically, you go for different rounds and you're trying to score a goal to win the game, right? It takes a whole afternoon. But that wasn't the thing. The thing was this, that in our neighborhood, we had a children's home in a middle, in an upper middle class area. So understand that the UK has a class structure, upper middle class. So now what basically happened was that this garden, attracted all different types of characters from a neighborhood. White, black, rich, poor, ex-cons, future convicts, right? Uh, Cool guys, beautiful girls. Like we had the whole smorgasbord of people that were attracted to our back garden on a Sunday and it was like Switzerland. So it meant that whether you were black, white, whether you were Asian, Malaysian, English, German, French, Russian, uh, um, Mauritian, African, it didn't matter. It was like when you came in, you would drop your ego and your preconception of or what or who you think people are based upon the color of the skin or the money in their pocket or the lack of money in their pocket. All of that went, went, out, went out the window. And what we would be left with were human beings connecting on the level which we can all relate to. And that level is being heard, seen, um, accepted for who we are. Now, when you experience something like that, for me, it impacted me so deeply that for the rest of my life, all I wanted to do was to emulate that, meaning I wanted to repeat that. So I mentioned to you before, um, I've put on over 2,000 plus events on five, in five different countries, uh, which have attracted over 1.5 million people in, in reality. And we're not talking about online. Online is far greater. We're talking like physically. And for each of those events, I was the person who was hosting those events, right? So this is the reason why the, at the age of 22, I had over 16,600 numbers in my phone, right? 80% of which I knew 
the last conversation that we had, right? So I was, I was on, but it, it was my why from how I grew up. Those times were some of the most beautiful times of connecting with the other guys and children, some of which are 18, 18 of them, plus all the other people in the, in the surrounding neighborhood. I felt that that was the highest ideal that I could live to to bring people together in an environment and to hold the space in a place where people feel comfortable to express who they are, what they're about, what they stand for, and to be accepted and heard regardless. So, so this is a very powerful reason for me to then um, be in a space where I, I, I create um, uh, this energy where people feel that, hey, I want to be part of that. So the, the nightclub days, uh, the event days, uh, Speak Up Monday, uh, the, the online communities that I've started and created or helped or guided, the driving why was that. So then from that, it's a logical progression, right, to um, I found myself, if you can create a space, if you can hold a space for human beings, for people, magic will always happen, right? You can be one of two things, you know, and this is a guy on, on uh, Joseph Ortega, uh, who was on um, Clubhouse yesterday, you can either create a space or you can fill a space. Now, neither one is better nor worse than the other. But to create a space means you create a group, you create opportunities for people to interact. Filling a space means that there's people who can fill that space. For example, if it's a podcast, they can fill that space of being a guest and contributing value in that podcast or the name could be Cameron, where they set up a podcast. In other words, Cameron, you're creating the space, you're holding the container, so you are creating the space, and today I am filling the space, right? So when you can do that, then magic happens, because then people coming into your space can be from anywhere in the world, can be from any walk of life can be, uh, you know, like how, how Madonna, but working with, with Madonna, how that happened, for example, is I was on a TV show called The Word in London. And because I was always a guy who used to get along with people and make people laugh and create this fun and, and enjoyment, right? All sorts of people ended up being in, in the same crew. The casting director, a lady called Julie Dunn, Irish girl, black hair, beautiful woman, Right. She and I just got on really well because she knew I had the energy of bringing people together, making the space comfortable for people to be in, which then allows people to soar, to be the best, to be their best selves. Right. So then when I moved to Italy um, with the modeling, which, again, that one, I met different people for going to an, an exhibition uh, from being open to the process of going to Milan. I met the people um, that would get me there. But that's another story. So, so when the MTV Music Awards came around, she knew that I was in Milan and she needed um, to recruit some VIP talent or audience for Madonna. And then she said, Rob, you're living in Milan. I know who you are. I haven't spoken to you for five years, but I know who you are. Can you help me with this? And I was like, of course I can. And then that's where the whole working with, with Madonna thing came from. So it's, as you mentioned before, it's all about relationships. So if we want to break the relationship down into its core that people watching this can walk away with, it will be this. The understanding that all of us are born with one of these and two of these. One of these and two of these. So that means if we ask questions and listen more than we speak, then the, I guess, the juice, the secret source, the mysteries, the opportunities will come to you. No doubt about it. Because, you know, one thing, as I'm going on this, mon on this mono monologue, sorry, but, but, but one thing that is certain is that people like the sound of their own voice. If you can be the person who's able to ask those questions and listen, listen, Actively, there are three types of listening. One listening is called listening to interrupt. And that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think listening to interrupt. The second type of listening is called uh, feigning to listen. This is where we're multitasking 
pretending that we're listening to what you're saying, but we're really, we're really, we're really not. We're doing this, we're going, mm -hmm. yeah, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. You don't have our attention. And the third type of listening is called active listening. Active listening is like listening with curiosity. It's listening for what the person's saying and what they're not saying. So when you combine good questions, active listening, then doors will open to you because people like to be around people who make them feel comfortable. People like to be around people who hear what they have to say. People like to be around people who accept them, right? I'm not saying you have to lie, but, but we've spoken about compassion earlier on today. We spoke about empathy, not sympathy, but empathy and how, and how we arrive at that. So if you listen actively with empathy, miracles will come your way, guarantee. Oh, I, I love every word you said. I think that's, that's hard because I, I'm definitely one of those people that I, when I step into a room, I always feel like I can always chip in and I always feel like I have to chime in and that because if I can't help that person, then I'm failing as a person. And the reality is, is a lot of the time, like you said, it's, it's not about what you can offer and open your mouth and that it's just keeping shut and listen because a lot of the time, most people don't really want advice. They don't want any um, critique or anything else. They just want to be heard. They just want to be validated in that. And so that was always hard for me, especially with that, that, uh, that brain. And that says, I have to fix this. I have to fix this. You don't have to fix it. Just listen, just like use these more. And that, so that's what something I've, I've tried to do better at um, is instead of just opening my mouth, just providing that high quality. Uh, one Listen, thing, Cam, though, just FYI, Cam, Cam, I, I'm, I'm quickly, I'm quickly going to interrupt you. In other words, do exactly what I said I, I wouldn't do, but there's a reason for yeah. it, right? It's, just, it's, it's very, very important. So whenever I speak on stages or speak to groups of people, I love telling stories. I love sharing stories, right? But there's two things which are critical, absolutely critical. One thing is this, right? We have ego and we have selflessness. Ego is, I love the sound of my own voice. Selflessness, let's call that a mission, a mission. So when I come and speak or do anything, right? Well, this, this podcast, for example, right? Where I come from, the only question I need to ask myself is, am I on my mission, right? So when I get lost, right? Or when someone asks me a question and I'm stuck in the middle of this, you know, this ego, because we all want to look good, right? So I'm there trying to look good and doing all this stuff to look good, blah, 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 blah. And I forget where I am. All that I need to do is ask myself, what is my mission? The minute I tap into my mission and come from there, then I am instantly giving value. Now, here's why it's important. So you, Cameron, have got an incredible uh, amount of value to give. And the fact that you feel drawn to contribute is really cool, right? But here's the thing. So long as you are coming from your mission, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter about the need to not to listen. And blah, blah. So long as you are coming from your mission, that is the crucial piece because you're either coming from your mission or ego. There's no in between. So, so long as you're coming from your mission, it's cool, right? And obviously, it's good to listen as Not well. to everyone, but you can't every you can't always please everyone, and that's another thing. No. It, no. I think that it holds us back as well. Is because we're always trying to please everyone, without realizing that in doing so, we're lying to ourselves. We're not being true to ourselves. That doesn't mean to be disrespectful. And I think there's always ways that we can improve, um, or more tactful ways of doing things. Um, mm. but my problem always was that my brain will go 5 billion miles an hour. Um, and sometimes my mouth just tries to keep up, um, which is not a good combination at all. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, um, 
Oh, and one thing I like what you are dropping, man, is absolute gold. And that, but I also know on the video podcast that that guy in the background that's just being a, a little uh, smug punk and that uh, is being very distracting from your message. Yeah. So if we can just cut him out, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so I, I just felt that it was very distracting from the message and like the, the energy that you were bringing to the table. And, and so I, I didn't want the, that to be taken away or take away from the value and the, the effort in your message. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's always intriguing to see, like, it, like you were saying, it, there's a balance to all things, right? Um, and that kind of goes to the metaphor that um, when you're, a, if you give everything, you'll be nothing. If you take everything, you'll just be a leech that, or a parasite. Yeah. So you're either feces or a parasite, but there's a middle ground, that, which is a, <laughs> which is a, a plant and a plant takes just enough nutrients from the ground and that to do um, and to grow, right? To build its root system, to take the nutrients it needs to blossom in that. But it also gives, it gives pollen, it gives nectar, it supplies and benefits to those around it. So that's why there's, there's always a middle ground. And when you find that middle ground, that's where you find, I think, I find that you have the most blossom, right? Mm. But it doesn't, a plant doesn't grow without strife. A plant literally grows when it's uncomfortable, when it so, doesn't get water. Like, so if mm. you overwater it, it doesn't grow because it doesn't need to work. It doesn't build its root system because it's always getting water. Mm. If, if uh, it always is getting sun, constant sun and everything, then it won't grow because it has no mm. reason to branch its leaves out anymore to mm. receive more light because it doesn't need it. Mm. So through the strife and that, and through those cool down in the nights and everything, it actually appreciates the sun more and realizes, hey, I need to grow to my full potential to get as much. Mm. But we also need to be a gardener in our own life to say, okay, uh, because. A plant, if you think about this, and I know I'm going a lot on gardening metaphors right now, but when you're gardening or pruning something, the plant, I'm sure, thinks it's like, why are you suffering or causing me to suffer? Why are you cutting mm. me back? Why are you neglecting me or cutting off my limbs, right? But the reality is, is we cut it off for the plant's benefit. It doesn't know that. It's just a plant. And it's just the only thing it understands is being a victim of its environment. Yeah. Are you, you keep dropping off there. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Because I noticed that. And, and we can just kind of close up here and I, cause it sounds like your internet's kind of telling you that it's, it's time anyway, but uh, what is kind of that final, <laughs> that uh, the final little piece of advice or words of wisdom from the great uh, Rob. Oh, man, like, so we've spoken today, you know, a lot about mastery and, and I can't, you know, stress it enough. You know, this understanding or idea that if we just make incremental improvements and sometimes it is like, you know, that, that game of snakes and ladders, which is frustrating sometimes, right? But so long as we keep on going, we learn and we apply and we take action. We're not afraid to, to make what people call mistakes. Mistakes is a mistake, right? a mistake. And we can come back from that. But, but you know, when I'm you know, maybe passed on to the next place, the next kind of life, you know, there's a great question uh, that a friend asked me or brought up a long time ago and said, you know, like on your tombstone, right? What do you want it to say? You know, do you want it to say, you know, look, here lies a guy who settled, you know, didn't fulfill his potential, a guy that was afraid all the time, a guy that, that, that fear was the dominating 
guide or teacher in his life, you know, and he died without doing anything that he wanted to do, you know, or do you want, you know, written on the tombstone when you, when you pass on to the next life, you know, here's a person who embraced life. Here is a person who took chances, right? Here's a person who fulfilled their potential. Here's a person who was always working towards inspiring, uplifting others. Here was a guy who was fulfilled. You know, he was a guy who lived his life, you know, without regret. You know, he was a guy who took mistakes in his, in his track, right, to become an incredible human being who not only was a stand for himself, his family, his friends, his community, but also his planet. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm just giving you just a frame, you know, that what is, what is really cool, no matter where you are right now in your life, fast forward 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years to when you passed on, there's a message on your tombstone. What is it that you want that message to say about you and your life and the contribution that you made to yourself, to your family, if you have one, to your community, if you have that. And what I would inspire you to kind of be, there was a, there's a great lady, right? And, and she, she was a nurse working in terminal, ter terminal care, right? So she was the person right, who, was, who was there to see people on to the next life. And she's been doing it for many, 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 many years. And the number one thing that those people said that they regretted, and the, the book is called Regret for the Dying, I think it's called Regret of, of, of the Dying. That's right. The one thing they regretted most wasn't necessarily the amount of money they had. It was they wished that they would have done in their life what they wanted for themselves, not what others wanted them to do. I'll repeat that again. So end of their life, this woman has seen hundreds of people ask them this question, you know, is there anything they regretted in their life? And they said, it wasn't about the money, it wasn't about that, it was about this. The number one was, you know, that they wish that they would have done, followed their own dreams and passions and not what other people, i.e. their parents, wanted or wished them to do. Oh, I know. For so, so I'll leave you my with parents those never two wanted, things. Like my parents never wanted me to be an entrepreneur. They thought I needed to get a real job. I mean, that's been a very mindset <laughs> and it's not for everyone. No. Right. Um, and and gra granted, it's, it's a struggle and it's a journey, but I realized that live or die, I will do it on my own terms. And th there's, a, there's a song that I really like that has the verbs and the main chorus of it is, I'd rather die for what I believe than live a life without meaning. And mm. that resonates. And it's always been kind of my mantra to life mm. then. Is, is I will rather die mm. and stand in, on my own terms than just have a life, an empty life without meaning. And that mm. I want it to stand for something. Wow want to have that meaning um and i want it because at the end of the day i i kind of had that deja vu that's you know sure i do computers and it but i that's not what i want to be known for like that doesn't do anything mm. everything i've done ever all the contributions i've done even for the fortune 500 clients everyone's like oh that's so great that you've had all these great contracts and that but for me it's like that doesn't mean anything all of my work, everything that I've done eventually is going to be ripped out, replaced, thrown away. That to me is almost saddening. It's disheartening. Yes, I was able to help people to their next phase or the next journey. But the fact is, is all of my work I know will not live on. The only work that I'm going to mm. be able to live on is something that keeps on giving. And so my legacy would be, and I, what I want it to be, is how I was able to help other people come from nothing. Mm. Just you were talking about and how you came from nothing to everything. I want to provide mm. other people those same tools to say, hey, it is possible. This is within mm. your reach. Now, I'm not saying you'll become a millionaire. I'm not saying you'll become a billionaire or whatever. 
but you can have financial stability. And I'd much rather just have financial mm. stability and be comfortable and happy and fulfilled and thrilled with life than to be filthy rich and miserable for the rest of my life. Mm. Right. There's a reason that many you, millionaires like Robin Williams and that have um, killed themselves. Money doesn't solve anything. Yeah. And I think that's a huge misconception. Um, mm. And so what we can do, and we need to stop lying to ourselves, right? It, it goes back to what you said, the mastery, the mastery of ourselves. And that means mm. to accept what we want to do, what our calling or whatever. And that might be a bunch of different things, trying everything under the sun. It doesn't matter which stage you're allowed to life. I mean, literally Colonel Sanders, started a multi-billion dollar company in his 70s. Mm. So it's never too late when it, there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that are like, oh, you're just a young guy. You know, you, you can say all this. And that. But the fact is mm. that it's not a young man's game. Everybody can accept their calling and then have it click. And it only takes that trial and error. Everyone thinks that we're overnight, like you were an overnight success, but even mm. you could testify probably to this. But it was not. It was a series of these trials and tribulations and um, discomfort that built up mm. that tolerance, that those calluses to give you the skills and ability to drive you where you are now, right? So. Right, man. Thought I can. Th thank you so much, man. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I think you're amazing. Right? Keep doing what you're doing. Right. And, uh, and look, I'm sure we're going to connect soon. Uh, love you, brother. Thank you so much. Not a problem. Uh, let the people here know where they can find you or where, where you would like to send them and that if they're, they want to get in contact with you or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Robert Ian. So Robert oh. Ian Vonick, the Scottish name. Robert Ian, so you can find me on Instagram, Facebook. Um, you can find me on my, my website that's being upgraded as we speak. And then uh, Speak Up Monday Group. So Speak Up, all one word, Speak Up Monday Group on Facebook uh, is, a really, is a really great group if you're interested in the speaking up. Um, if you want to turn your story into impact and income, then, then the group there is uh, how to turn your story into a profitable business and brand. So how to turn your story into a profitable business and brand. And that's another Facebook group um, that, that you can interact with me on. And obviously Club, Clubhouse has got that one already, Rob, Rob Ian Bonnick, Rob Ian Bonnick on Clubhouse. All right? Yep, and that's uh, Robert Ian, I-A-N Bonnick, B-O-N-N-I-C-K. So if you guys are listening, to got this, it. check this out and then go, got it. Yeah, go buy his book, Soul Survivor. I think that will open it. Um, do you have an audio book for that? Not yet. Um, so the, 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 the publisher is happen. New Holland. And I was supposed to have done that when I was back in Australia, but didn't get the chance. But yeah, so Soul Survivor, how an abandoned child goes from nothing to everything published by New Holland. All right, that's that's the name of the book. Yeah, so you can find that also um, on my website, but also uh, if you just go uh, Soul Survivor, How an Abandoned Child Went From Nothing to Everything, it will come up with the link uh, on the New Holland site um, to, to get that book. All right, awesome. Well, I, I already know that uh, we're definitely going to connect again no matter what. I think it's uh, Damn there's perfect. so much unlimited app knowledge that you have within your, your brain and that that I, I'm definitely going to want to I, I'm, and I know that some of our listeners will definitely want to dive into a little bit more um, and, and just to get to know you a little bit more and see what uh, other valuable life lessons that we can gain. Um, so I, again, appreciate you. I appreciate your energy. I appreciate your spirit uh, of giving and uh, everything that you've been willing to do here. Um, again, that's an absolute honor to, to know you and uh, to have that acquaintance and that friendship. Um, and, uh, again, thank you for, for all that time. And I, I wish you the best. I, I know you need to get going. So thanks again. Thank you, my brother.
Really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.